everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Breaking into Family Law. I'm Carrie Holmes and I'll be your moderator today along with my wonderful colleague Ron Reitstein of Youngman Reitstein PLC. Uh, before we begin, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, if at any time during the presentation you have a question for one of our wonderful presenters, please put it in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and we're hopeful we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Thanks, Carrie. The Family Law section is sponsored by White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt, LLP, and Our Family Wizard. White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. Our Family Wizard is a secure co-parenting platform that supports divorced or separated parents in managing the daily responsibilities of raising children. Specialized features help co-parents organize routines, share files, track expenses and payments, check in at exchanges, send messages and more, all while thoroughly documenting their activity. Great, and we wanted to make sure to have everyone please mark your calendars for some wonderful upcoming programs from the BHBA's Family Law section. Uh, first up uh, is Direct Examination with Dan and Lauren, uh, where each month Dan Bemmel and Lauren Youngman interview family law community members in a hybrid CLE interview format, weaving together a modern podcast with a traditional case-oriented CLE. Together, they track each guest's professional history, exploring key moments in their career and practices, landmark family law cases, and legislation that has special resonance. The next two episodes, um, first is July 6th at 1230 with our BHBA family law section fearless leaders, Gina King and Kendra Thomas, and then August 3rd at 1230 with Tony Storm and Tigran Pallian. And then in between those, uh, the Family Law section will be hosting a webinar called What's New in Department 2 on July 28th at noon uh, with Judge Amy Pellman. And now onto the program. All right, so let's, uh, let's start by introducing our wonderful panelists. Um, first, we have uh, Nafisa Ahmed. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Political Science from Cal Poly Pomona. She received her JD from UC Irvine School of Law. She's a 2020 law graduate. She currently works at, as an Equal Justice Works Fellow. Her fellowship is sponsored by Uber Technologies and Cooley LLP. Her host organization is Peace Over Violence, a nonprofit based in the greater Los Angeles area. Her current fellowship project aims to assist domestic violence survivors in family law proceedings. Next up, we have Chelsea Stevens. Chelsea is an associate attorney at one of the largest family law firms in California. Feinberg, Mindel, Brend, and Klein. Chelsea became an associate at FMBK after her summer as one of FMBK's summer associates in 2017. Her practice focus, focuses exclusively in family law. Prior to graduating from Loyola Law School, Los Angeles, Chelsea clerked for the Honorable Mark Gross at the Stanley Moss Courthouse in Los Angeles. Chelsea also worked with the LA Center for Law and Justice, providing low-cost family law services for indigent clients in Los Angeles. While at Loyola, Chelsea served as president of the Women's Law Association and president of the Children and Family Law Association. Chelsea was recognized as a rising star super lawyer in family law in 2020, 2021, and 2022. In addition to her legal practice, Chelsea serves as a vice chair on the executive committee of the BHBA family law section. Chelsea also uh, participates in continuing legal education programs as presenter and panelist. And next we have Sam Klein. Samantha Klein is a partner and head of the California Family Law Practice at Withers Worldwide. She has nearly 20 years of litigation experience representing high net worth and high profile clients in many different fields, including the entertainment and sports industry, executives, entrepreneurs, doctors, and attorneys, as well as their spouses. She represents clients in all aspects of family law, uh, concentrating much of her practice in the areas of complex financial issues custody disputes, and parenting issues. Samantha is also a trained minors counsel and mediator. Samantha was recognized as super lawyer in family law in 2021 and 2022. She was also named Hollywood Reporter's top 20 lawyers for divorce in 2018. Early in her career, Samantha was recognized as a rising star in family law. In addition to her legal practice, Samantha serves on the executive committee of the BHBA family law section, and in 2019 joined the board of directors of C5 Youth Foundation of Southern California. 
She continues to volunteer as a mediator for the Los Angeles Superior Court ADR panel and participates in continuing education programs as both a lecturer and panelist. Thank you to all of you so much for being here with us today. Um, our first question for you all is, when did you know you wanted to practice or when did you end up in family law? Not all at once. <laughs> Um, well, since I'm like the, the oldest person on this call, apparently, um, I didn't know that I wanted to practice family law until I had already realized that what I thought I wanted to practice, I really didn't want to practice. So I decided, figured I didn't want to practice uh, environmental law. And then somebody suggested to me that I volunteer at Levitt and Quinn while waiting for my raw results. And it, like day one, it took. And I was sold and I now actually don't think I'm capable of practicing any other form of law or by the way, having any other type of job. So there, that's how I knew. Thanks. What about Chelsea or Nafisa? Sure. Happy to, happy to go next. Um, I probably have the unique experience of going to law school, wanting to practice family law and just got really lucky that it turned out that that was something I wanted to do really, <laughs> once I learned what it was. Um, so I kind of structured my law school experience from the very beginning towards a family law practice. I kind of um, sought out resources for that. And, you know, like I said, lucky enough, it turned out to be something that I really wanted to do. So I think it maybe have a unique experience in that way. But I know there's a lot of people in this world that kind of fall into family law and figure out something they love. And I, I love that. I love that experience for people too. Thanks. I had actually had my first exposure to family law um, when I was an undergrad. I used to work at the Pomona Superior Courthouse's um, self-help center where they assist with family law and housing. And um, I did justice court there for a year. And afterwards I was like, I don't ever wanna do family law. Uh, <laughs> this is so emotionally draining. Um, but when I started law school after my first summer, I sort of fall back into it. Um, I worked at the domestic violence, UCI's domestic violence clinic. Um, and then um, after my second year, I interned at the Harriet View High Center where I met Carrie. And um, just doing it over and over again and just it being something that I felt more naturally drawn to and something that I was better at than other, I guess, um, subject areas in law school and other things that I was trying out um, is sort of what led me to uh, practice in it now. Great. I'm sure you guys get all the time the question of how, how why, why do you do that? How do you do that? Does, that, does, that, does anyone kind of want to answer that question or, or, or give us their canned response to, uh, you know, everyone in their life that says, I don't understand how you do that? We don't have canned responses, Ron. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Jeez, what do you think you must we not are? get it as often as me. <laughs> um, I'll, I'm happy to answer. I'm very uh, happy to say it. I, I like to tell people I'm a problem solver. I like to solve problems. And problems when it comes to people's families and their personal lives are really important. And I don't take it home with me, their problems, because I usually feel like I've left it on the table trying to help them be constructive in solving them. And, and so the only thing I ever have I bring home is when opposing counsels or judges frustrate me. And so that's something as a lawyer you have to come to terms with anyway. <laughs> There's my answer. Someone actually sent me an Instagram meme where they said, I became a divorce attorney because I live for drama. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was like, well, I guess that that's part of it. Um, it's never boring. Um, I don't think you could ever walk into family court and ever be bored um, sometimes. And I'm so grateful for mass sometimes because you'll see litigants saying the most outrageous things and you can kind of like hide your facial expression <laughs> under a mask. Um, but I, I wanted to do this just because I think that there's a need for greater representation, um, particularly since I work with domestic violence survivors or indigent populations. Um, there's no right to counsel in child custody or DV um, cases. And I, I, I did this because I, I believe in a sort of access to justice. Um, uh, model and that's what sort of drew me to it. 
I think, I think for me, it took me a little while to kind of figure out an answer to that question. I know at the very beginning of my career, I was thinking sort of the same thing to myself. I was like, wow, okay, this is very intense. I get a lot of intense phone calls. I get a lot of intense emails. Like, I, you know, people want answers from me. Maybe I don't always have the answer. That was really kind of frightening. I was like, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't know how to do all, all of these things you're asking me to do is a lot of these things don't have right answers. Um, but to my perspective has sort of changed as I practice a little longer and I realize at least in this particular area and a lot of other practice areas as well, like we're just human people dealing with human problems and they need guidance and they need someone to help them talk through these things. Like it's a very emotional time. It's a very stressful time for a lot of people. They, they don't know what they're going to do next or where they're going to go next. And they really just need someone to kind of tell them it's going to work out. It seems scary right now. We don't, there's a lot of unknowns but we're gonna figure it out and it's okay that you don't know what's going on right now. That's okay. Uh, they're, they're really just human people looking for someone to tell them it's gonna be all right. I think those are wonderful answers. Um, I also totally agree with Nafisa that it's, it is, I think the best, most interesting practice area. There are a lot of really boring things you can do as a lawyer and family law is not one of them. <laughs> um, all right. so. Uh, we have in our audience a, a fair number of law students. Um, so can any of you tell us about any internships or law school experiences in particular, maybe in a little bit more detail that helped you get a job in family law? Uh, sure. I mean, I can talk about a couple of things. Like I said, I, I sort of structured, I had the benefit of structuring my law school experience around this practice area. Um, so I had an opportunity to do a lot of things from the very beginning, but reaching out to your career development center or your career counselor is a really, really great place to start if you have questions. I, I didn't know what to expect. I thought family law was kind of an area that was not a lot of people did, and I didn't really know what to do. And my career counseling center actually had a ton of information for me and was super helpful in connecting me with other practitioners or, you know, organizations that you can join as a law student. Like I think BHBA has a law student program that you can join. That was really great. Um, I did an externship with a family law judicial officer, Judge Gross, and when he was still in family law. And that was one of the best experiences that I ever had. Something that uh, was super special that he did for his externs was take them to networking events with him, which was really helpful to have somebody to help you meet people and help introduce you to folks. And that's where I found FMBK was attending an event with the, which the, with the judge. And he was really helpful in, you know, saying like, she's great. She's awesome. Having that back backup person who kind of vouched for you was really, really helpful. Um, so I would encourage anybody who's pretty serious about considering a family law career to try to find a judge to work for the experience that you get working with them is, you know, so valuable and a lot of them are really, really interested in helping law students find, you know, a pathway into family law or whatever it is they might want to do. I can go next. Um, so I only recently graduated from law school, I guess. No, it's been two years. Um, so I, I did justice core at the self-help center and i don't think you have to necessarily be a part of that branch you could you could volunteer at self-help centers i'm not really sure what their structure looks like with covid um, or post-pandemic uh, measures but um and then i did the domestic violence clinic at uci and then all my other uh internships and externships throughout law school were for family law um organizations um, and that really helped i also took family law as a class at law school which is more of a con law class it, it doesn't necessarily go over how to actually practice family law but it's, it's good background information and i'm sure professors who teach that class can introduce you to um uh people who can help launch your career um i also took community property which i would highly advocate taking because it's on the bar and it's not really something you want to have to learn by yourself um in, in two weeks. So I would highly recommend taking community property and then whatever family law classes your law school also offers on top of that. I think that we should stand on those answers. The <laughs> only thing I will add is that when you're looking to get hired after law school and after you've taken the bar or even for a summer position, 
volunteering at domestic violence programs, working for a judge, extraing with a judge, that all makes you more marketable. And so you should consider that as well, because I know we all go to law school and it's great, but we also need to get jobs afterwards for a plethora of reasons. So keep in mind that those um, experiences really do translate well into the job market. Yeah. Um, as the pro bono manager on the call, love that you said that, Sam. Thank you so much for, for having said that. Um, and even though I don't work there anymore, um, the Butte High Center in particular has a couple of um, programs that are like specifically designed to teach volunteers family law. So there's one called the Family Law Intensive Program, FLIP, um, where you can volunteer um, a fairly significant number of hours a week working like directly with a, a staff attorney and when I was there, I, you know, had a wonderful experience with all my flip people and um, felt like they really learned a lot and then got jobs after so. And, you know, part of part of um, assembling this group together was to highlight different avenues in in family law. Um, you know, these are you guys represent different types of practices, um, Nafisa with nonprofit, Sam with big law, like uh, historically big law, and Chelsea with big family law. Um, so one of the questions we have is what, what, what do you think um, sets, it, what advantages do you have being in the type of organization that you have in practicing family law? Are there disadvantages that you would be willing to disclose just to, you know, the, the four of us? Um, and, uh, you know, how, how, how things are a little bit different from your organization, especially if you've had experiences in, in others. Okay, I'm happy to jump in. So I spent the first 18 years, geez, of my career at a very well-known boutique family law firm in Los Angeles. And I was trained by some of the best lawyers and people who, I have a great relationship with Stowe, and it's, it was a fantastic experience. But my clients have become more sophisticated. I feel like I feel like the, as the world has gotten smaller, there's more international-based work that needs to be done. There's lots of different types of assets, and there's just more complex issues. And so I decided to go into a big law firm. Um, we're I think an AM two hundred law firm and start the family law practice because I have the benefit now of walking down the hall, right? Or walking down the Zoom or whatever it is and talking to people in any one of a plethora of different specialty areas from estate planning lawyers to trust and estates litigation to business, um, really tax, I mean, which comes up a lot actually. And so for me, that was one of the reasons why I decided to transition from a small boutique to a bigger firm, because I think I can better service my clients in giving them access to a wider amount of expertise and subject matter experts. Um, and I think it has been immensely helpful because you're able to pivot much quicker. And I think that family law lawyers have this tendency of being like, oh yeah, that tax language is fine. Like I kind of get it, right? Well, I don't have to do that anymore. And that makes me much more comfortable, frankly, because I can send the language to one of my partners and just say, hey, what do you think about this? Yes, no, maybe, oh wait, can you think, what do you think about this? And it's, it's a dialogue and it really does make it much easier to better service a client, which I think at the end of the day should be all of our goals, right? We're in a service industry. So I think that answers your question, good and challenging. Uh, I can I can go next. Um, I have been practicing for about four years, and so I've only ever worked with FMBK, including as a summer. Um, so my experience is, you know, just with this firm. And I can say, and maybe Samantha can kind of jump in and tell me if I'm wrong, but my perception of sort of a big law firm would be that um, younger associates don't necessarily get a ton of hands-on experience. Maybe that's just my perception or based on like bigger law firms. Um, but for me, having practiced only four years, I've already done two trials that I've prepped myself and I've had 
that backup person from a partner just to make sure heaven forbid nothing you know goes down in flames which was just really it, it actually helped me to feel a lot more comfortable in doing those things on my own to know that i had some backup just in case there was an issue um but my my perception would be that for someone at my level at a big law firm maybe they wouldn't have that type of experience i have a lot of client contacts i have kind of a range of issues that i work on from small cases with smaller issues to big complex cases and working in a law firm that's all family law practitioners is incredible just in terms of um, getting help when you need it asking questions um, having like really in-depth kind of like legal discussions you know about issues that maybe don't have answers it's it's a really great place to just kind of talk to people learn a little bit have these intellectual conversations with other practitioners in your area um, so that's something that i feel is maybe unique about about my experience at this firm um so i've only ever worked in nonprofit settings and what i can say is that um every nonprofit works differently uh we're not typically billing clients uh in, in order to generate revenue most of the the nonprofit or the organization's funding comes from different grants and each nonprofit uh, um, gets their money from different kinds of grants with different kinds of requirements. So a piece over violence, it's more of a numbers base. It's not necessarily the work product that you get for the client or how many, uh, just as an example, it's not how many divorce petitions you filed, but for us, it's the number of people served. So our model is a little bit different in terms that I'm trying to help a as many people as I possibly can with smaller issues. Um, but I also work for really small nonprofits. So there's only one other family law attorney um, in addition to myself. And with um, a variety of different challenges I had during my fellowship, I've sort of had to supervise myself since I graduated law school. Um, so I got my, I got admitted, yeah, it was during the pandemic, so I had that late admission into January, and I got my bar card, and then I went to court by myself, uh, no backup. <laughs> um, so I, if you like doing that, then this would be the realm for you. Um, I work almost more like a solo practitioner, I would say, rather than um, in a team setting. However, I've had to network a lot. Um, with people um, in, in the greater Los Angeles area to sort of help out. Like I emailed Carrie last night <laughs> asking if she had templates that I could use um, because you're not going to, I mean, I don't know everything. I've, I've sort of had to self-teach myself along the way. And I'm grateful that I was able to create a network of other family law attorneys to help me when I, I don't know the answer. Um, but I would say not again, not all nonprofits are like that, but you are expected to perhaps in some in some areas do a little bit more. Um, they they just may not be enough staff for backup is is one of the the challenges that I would say exist. Um, but again, it's it's different. It was not like that at Harry Buhai, but it is like that in some of the other nonprofits that I worked at before. Um, and not to kind of skip ahead in our questions, but I think there's a, a good transition here. Um, besides kind of, of course, being active in the Beverly Hills Bar Association, do you find networking to be useful in your practice? And what type of networking do you do? And what would you recommend that new attorneys or law students do? I can pivot off of that since I was I was talking about it first. Um, so there's something called the Family Law Coalition, which is a group of nonprofit attorneys based out of um, a family law attorneys based in the Los Angeles area. And we have an email thread. And every single time I have a question, <laughs> I just email the email thread and I ask for assistance, templates, um, and just general guidance. Um, I've also just started conversations with other attorneys in court hallways. Um, I actually met an attorney from FMBA, B, oh, sorry, I'm saying that wrong, FMBK um, during one of my first court appearances because I, I didn't really know what the judge was asking and, I, and um, they were able to sort of help me along the way as well. So networking has honestly been the, the main way that I've been able to actually do my practice. I, I think... I think something Nafisa said that was really important was like, you know, 
somebody was willing to reach out and kind of help, right? They were like, oh, I see this person. They maybe need some help. Like, let me just chat with them and see if I can like help with this issue. And that's something that I have found to be incredibly amazing about the family law practice is there's so many practitioners in this field that are wanting to see new young people come in and be practicing family law and they want to help and they're willing to reach out to you, have Zooms, have coffee meetings, have lunches, talk to you, give you samples, talk about legal issues or talk about case issues. Like the, the, the best advice I can give is just reach out and you'll be so surprised that people are really, really, really just wanting to help you. I know there's like this little bit of fear of like, mm, maybe they didn't respond for a week or whatever. Like you, we're, we're all super busy. And I know it's not an excuse, but like, we're all really nice people. I promise. I promise we're all really nice people and we really do want to be helpful. I think that as a, for young lawyers who are trying to make a name for themselves um, or even break into it, I think the thing that really is the most important is doing a good job. And that, you know, there's all sorts of, networking is, it was a very different thing when I started practicing law and it wasn't as formal and, you know, obviously nobody was doing anything on Zoom or whatever else. Um, so it was a little less accessible. You didn't always know everybody, you didn't always have opportunities to meet people. But um, the way I felt like I always developed relationships and therefore networked, right, with lawyers and other firms was by doing a good job, by working with people, by being a problem solver. And so I think that building that type of reputation for yourself that you work hard and things is one of the best things that you can do. And the way it translates is that I, I have refer I get referrals from tons of people within the community, other lawyers, you know, business managers who I've worked, worked with in the past, I mean, people who I haven't heard from in 10 years, I get referrals from still. And it's because I did a good job when I worked for them in the first place. So really, I would be less concerned about going to a networking event and more concerned about doing your job, if that makes sense. But yes, we're all very accessible. And if not, if, <laughs> but if not, but, but, you, but Chelsea said is correct. Like you, I miss emails like that all the time. Oh, hey, I'll get back to it, right? Don't be, don't be afraid to follow up. Don't think you're being annoying. Maybe reach out to somebody else in the firm. Try to figure out who the secretary is, who this lawyer works with. Like, there are lots of ways to get in. You just have to persevere a little bit. And it doesn't mean that the person you're reaching out to isn't interested. It just, it's life, right? A, a couple of you touched on um, mentorship, um, you know, through your, through the practice and, and development in, in family law. Uh, how, how has that shaped, you know, the way that you practice? Um, has it been instrumental? Is it, is it something that you, uh, intend to do going forward to become a mentor? Um, do you have mentees? How, like how, how has that evolved for you as a practitioner? I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, I, have ha I have a lot of mentors at this firm in particular um, that has been really helpful for me in learning what my own practice style is working with these people who are also serving as mentors has really helped me to figure out like, okay, maybe I practice a little bit more like this as opposed to this, or I really like how that person practices, but I don't know that I can do that. Maybe I'm going to try to make, take some steps to practice how they're practicing, see if that works. Um, and it, and it also is just a realization of there is not one way to practice. Everybody has their own things that they want to do. There's a lot of litigators in my firm, but there's a lot of people who are really, really mediation focused and being able to work with those people and talk to them about their practice is really helpful in figuring out how you want to practice and what works for you and what doesn't. Um, in terms of, do I have mentees? I don't know that I necessarily have mentees. We have our summer program and um, a lot of uh, the younger associates have been through the summer program or can really kind of make space for our summer associates. And so I think the summer associates spend a lot of time with the newer associates in the firm. Um, 
and we're we're a firm that's really helpful for our associates of like you know in terms of giving samples sharing information you know we're all really accessible and asking questions is super easy it's not that cutthroat environment of like oh you don't know how to do that discovery response well i'm just gonna not say anything and just see how it works out for you like that's not how we operate in this firm at all we're all really interested in helping everyone grow in their practice um so i think in some respects, maybe like the associate pool kind of serve as like mentor mentees to each other, which is is really great. And I I really admire that about this firm that there's that kind of culture and that kind of environment here. I think I said this when I first started, which is that I was trained by a lot of really awesome lawyers. And so I clearly had mentorship um, from the very start of my career, to be honest with you. And I would argue that even when I was a volunteer at Levin and Quinn before I passed the bar and got my job, that I had somebody, Jeff Jacobson, who I look to as, he was, I feel like he's very instrumental in my life. He, he thinks that he like poo-poos me when I say it, but it's true. Um, and, and so I think I've always been blessed in that way. And I think it's our jobs as practitioners to always be collaborative, Chelsea and always to share your approaches and um, I don't know that I don't think it needs to be a formal mentor mentee relationship I think that the concept is that you're trying to learn from lots of different people and get feedback in lots of different ways and how that helps you grow in your practice and how you want to be as a lawyer I think that it's extremely important and um, I I enjoy the process of working with newer and younger lawyers and seeing how they blossom. It sounds so cheesy, but I do. I have a first year right now, he's now second year, who had never practiced family law, wasn't going to be a litigator, it was going to transactional work. I remember the first time I was like, okay, go call the client and take care of it. He's like, and he, afterwards, he's like, that wasn't bad. And the bottom line was that he's working hard, trying, right? Give, believing in himself, right? And that's because you have to trust people and you have to encourage them. And if you do that, the sky sky's the limit. So I think that you have to be open to learning from everybody, good and bad, right? Not just people in your firm, not people, just family law lawyers that you like, sometimes family law lawyers that you don't like, you learn a lot from too. So just having that openness and it is very important though that you be willing to take all that in. I would say I definitely have a lot of mentors through the the community. I suppose community based mentoring, um, if you know, not from my organization. Um, in terms of mentees, I'm still only a second year attorney, um, but I I do um, often help a lot of law students who are looking to um, do a public interest fellowship. Um, I was one of the um, so at UCI, I was one of the um, first ones to get the Equal Justice Works Fellowship in quite a while. So um, I did assist others who were interested in doing similar um, fellowships, uh, you know, apply and, and try to do that. And I do supervise uh, law student interns, which is um, interesting as I'm also <laughs> trying to learn how to practice law. I Last summer, I took interns with me to court watch while I figured out how to do hearings. So that was fun. Um, but it's it's surprising also how much you can learn in a short amount of time when you're thrown into it um and i also it, it's also easy to keep in perspective that a lot of opposing counsel are also new solo practitioners so it feels less intimidating in that matter um so it's, it's easy to sort of learn from each other as well um so let's talk about the sort of realities of practicing as a family law attorney. Um, what's your caseload like? How do you manage it? Has it changed over time? Um, when you first started, how did you kind of handle the ramp up to uh, having clients calling you and asking you for things? Oh, I remember when I used to sleep. What are you talking about, Carrie? Come on now. <laughs> I mean, that was like so many years ago, but geez, can't you tell? Um, I'm in a very different position because I run a practice group with, you know, four or five lawyers and we're expanding. But um, I think that family law is 
awesome in so many ways, but I think that there are a lot of clients with unrealistic expectations about how quickly we can get them what they want or what they think they want and what that looks like. And that you wake up, I wake up every day with a task list and then I'm like, okay, here's my A list for today, right? Here's my like, it would be nice. And here's my like, eh, right? It can wait another day. And inevitably by noon, I haven't accomplished anywhere near what I thought I would have accomplished because 17 other things come up, right? Things you don't expect or, or take longer or whatever it is, right? People have, problems, people have issues you need to help with. So for me, I think that you're always, I feel like I'm oftentimes chasing it, right? Chasing the tasks and trying to really service clients. Um, and I think that that's kind of the practice of one. It's good to be busy, but you also have to learn how to say no to clients and to potential new clients and just say, look, if I take this case, it's going to inevitably, at least in the short term, affect my ability to service my existing clients. And so part of it is learning how to manage and understand that it never takes, if you think it's going to take an hour, it's probably going to take three, right? So conceptually, and that you have to bake that in and, and be really conscious of it so you don't get behind, you don't get angry emails or whatever from clients. So, and by the way, if you're a younger lawyer and you're delivering to a partner, that you actually keep your deadlines. Because if you don't, then it throws them off. And then suddenly they're up in the middle of the night, early in the morning, trying to get things done too. So that's, it's not easy. And it's a, it's a balance and you can do it, but you have to have boundaries too. Yeah, I think so many of what Samantha, so many of the things Samantha said are very true of my practice as well. I was I'm just looking at my little list. I keep on my desk of all of my client names and looks like I'm at about 36 cases right now, which is probably pretty high. Um, but uh, in order to manage something like that, a case list that long, you've got to have a balance of types of cases. There's going to be slower moving, a little more simple cases where you're kind of just, you know, doing your basic forms, you're doing basic legal issues, and you're just kind of shepherding a settlement or something like that. And then you've got maybe a couple of big cases that you, you know, touch a couple times a week and you're doing big projects and they require a lot of your attention. Like you've got to have a balance of how much time you're going to spend on each thing. Otherwise you're going to go absolutely nuts. Um, <clears throat> but I think something that Samantha said that's incredibly important is communication, both with clients and with partners. If you work with partners, um, you've got to be communicating about timing of things. You've got to be communicating about your availability. And I, something I had to learn that was really hard for me to internalize was like communicating with clients about my life, which is really strange. But a lot of times, like your life gets in the way. You're a human person too. I was out with COVID two weeks ago and it was a lot of communication with clients of, you know, I am out sick. I'm really sorry. I this I know this is important to you, but I am out sick. And the amount of people that responded back going, oh, I totally understand having COVID is absolutely terrible. Like I, I got it. We'll talk next week instead of, you know, just saying like, I'm working on it. I'll get to it. And you don't really want to have that conversation because it feels a little bit like an excuse it's actually just, we're all human people and we have to have these conversations. And, you know, I, I think something Samantha said that was important too was communicating about deadlines with partners. Like in the very beginning, have an understanding of when the project needs to be due, talk to them if you need more time, those kinds of things so that they know where you're at and you don't ever want to end up in a situation where even if you need more time and that would have been okay if you asked for it, since you didn't ask for it, now it's late then everything's just kind of jammed and messed up and like you never want to be in that situation. It doesn't feel good for you. It doesn't feel good for your partner. And you just got to really, really communicate about things. I just want to add one thing, Chelsea, just kind of responsive to something you said as well, which is that, and you're entitled to have a life. Yeah. And that, right? And that I mean, you're like it's time sensitive. And you're like, wait, you want to talk about your kids' baseball dues that are due in two weeks like this is not what I'm going to do on a Saturday or a Sunday or at 7 p.m at night like that's where it goes to the boundaries because you are entitled to have a life and if you let clients infringe on it too much it, it, it's like a slippery slope right so keep that in mind as well I mean like you said like it's okay you can be sick you can go on vacation you can decide that 
you want to go to the mall at three o'clock on a Friday and that you're done. Like that sometimes is going to have to be okay. And don't be afraid of it. Don't tell me you went to the mall because you might run into them, but don't be afraid of it. <laughs> have a, a show of hands uh, whose clients have their cell phone numbers. Everyone. I have like one or two. Yeah. I have a work cell phone, so I can put it in a separate drawer if I need to. <laughs> yeah, fancy carry. <laughs> so. Oh, uh, Nafisa, you're you have... muted if you're trying to answer. Oh, I was going to say, um, so after my first year, I had a supervising attorney tell me, if you want to work life balance, you shouldn't have been a lawyer. And I thought, oh, okay, I guess that's how I should expect to do this for the rest of my life. And um, it was really hard to figure out how to set a caseload when I started, because again, I'm in a unique position where um, I'm working more or less as a solo practitioner in, in the department. So I, I could choose which clients that I wanted to take on. I could set my own caseload. And as long as we were getting enough clients retained, um, nobody was gonna tell me uh, you know, which clients I would or wouldn't take on. Um, a very unique position as a second year attorney, because most of the times I do believe your supervising attorney just tells you which case you're going to take on and how many cases you're going to balance. So with no expectation of how to actually practice or, you know, do what I was going to do, I retained every single client I did an intake for unless they were going to um, have issues that I knew that our organization just wouldn't have the resources to be able to handle. And then I started going to court every single day and realized that this was not how um, I was going to best be able to actually meet client goals. And then I had to nail it completely back um, from that. And I set myself to about maybe no more than 16 active cases um, at one time. Also taking into consideration that I don't have a secretary. Um, that I have to do my own mailing. I often have to file paperwork on behalf of my clients by actually going down to the courthouse and filing them um, because my clients also, again, domestic violence survivors, indigent um, populations, they're not going to be able to, um, I, I, like I had a client who's wheelchair bound. And so I, I was going to have to be responsible for taking his divorce petition to a courthouse about 40 miles from where I lived. And so I had to factor in time to be able to do that and actually do a good job at representing clients. So I limited myself to 16 active clients at a time and that worked for me. Now I'm at the tail end of my fellowship and I'm kind of on my way out. So it's, I, I do have work-life balance now because there's only <laughs> so many types of cases that I can take on. Um, but I, I, I had to have that like hard conversation with myself and also just to tell myself I can't take on you know, it, it sucks because people come to our intakes in, in need of major assistance. They're often in fear for their life. And I had this moment where I felt I had to save every single person that came to my caseload. And that's just not productive to them. And it's not productive to your practice. When you have those conversations with yourself, who do you bill? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, we, we have a, a great Q&A uh, that came in um, and uh, also want to encourage the rest of the participants to um, submit Q&As. Um, if you see, there's a button at the bottom of the uh, Zoom session um, with that ability. So this one's for Samantha. Are there any recommendations you have on getting into family law at a big firm? Is it more competitive, similar to getting a job in another practice at a big law firm? I am so glad you actually asked me because I've been sitting here looking at it and trying to figure out how to respond to it. And it's one of those things that was just like, I don't know how to really explain this in words. Um, so those, it's the same and it's different. So in boutique firms, hiring somebody who is fresh out of law school is a very tough sell because I mean, you guys, you don't know what you're doing. You've never practiced law before. Practicing law is a lot different than going to law school, right? I mean, if only I had known. But you know, so you might have an easier, might be easier for you to move into a bigger law firm, or at least because they have technically, theoretically have at least resources, right? And sometimes they have summer programs and whatever else. That said, that boutique law firms don't hire recruiters usually. It's usually some advertisements in the Daily Journal. 
But from my experience, we used to interview people, get a good resume and be like, oh, well, you know, you're kind of always looking, like if you find a good candidate. Um, and we would, we've hired people like that before at my old firm. And I do it now too. I mean, I've interviewed many people who've just submitted who, you know, I didn't necessarily have an open rec, but I knew I was going to be hiring. And so you interview people and it's, it's interesting to see who's out there and maybe somebody's not a right fit at that moment, but they will be um, down the road. So in big law, it's the same process though, no matter what practice group you're in, whether you're a civil litigator, whatever it is, or a transactional lawyer, you go through the same people through HR, oftentimes there's recruiters, or you can self-submit. And the big thing I would say is don't be afraid to submit a resume, even if you don't see an open rec for one, for, for something. You know, sometimes you're not actively looking, but you're keeping your eyes open. I know I do that. Um, and I've done that for a long time because you just, you never know the person you're going to connect with or is going to fill a need or you suddenly have a need um, or you've been thinking about it. So put yourself out there and do it because um, you just don't know. I don't know if that really answered the question, but if Jennifer, if you have a follow-up, feel free to throw it in the chat. I, I would also add um, use, use alumni networks. I mean, you've got, you, especially if you're, um, if you come from a smaller school where there's not a lot of alumni everywhere, you'll stand out more with, with partners that have access, you know, that, that are doing hiring. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the local um, law schools have a lot of practicing partners and um, they love the fact that you went to their law school. So don't, don't be shy. And just one more thing, which is, Ron, you totally made me think of it, which is that if you send, family law is a small community, and if you send a canned letter where, or cover letter, and it clearly shows that you didn't even look at the person's bio online, or the firm, to like, you know, it, it doesn't, you're not going to get an interview, or you're not going to get hired, at least look at the website, right? At least look at the lawyers who are on the website, like, try and personalize it, try and do something. Um, show that you've done the research because it shows that you actually want the job as opposed to you're just sending out resumes. Um, and I've seen it many times where people, like, I wanna learn more about your firm. And the way it was said was something like, well, that's on the website. Like you didn't even, <laughs> like, so just do your homework. I think something some, like piggybacking off of what Samantha said is like a lot of law schools just kind of have these template cover letters or something like that, that they kind of give you this spiel that you should put in your cover letter and people tend to just recycle that over and over. And for a firm like us who has a summer program that we elicit resumes from all of these law schools, Carrie is looking fabulous right now. Thank you. I so genuinely don't know what's going on. I'm gonna turn off my video for a second while I try and not be purple. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when we get these, you know, resumes from the law schools and we get 25 of the exact same cover letter with the name just changed, it's like that's we know exactly where that came from. And if we get a cover letter that's unique or you know some something different than just this law school template that actually stands out to us a lot more because we, when we're looking for summers or new associates, we know you guys are just graduating law school. You probably don't have a lot of experience. You might not even have family law experience, but we're, we're not looking for the person who has done every single family law thing and knows exactly what to, what to do in practicing. That's not necessarily what we're looking for. We're looking for good candidates who are gonna do good work, who wanna work hard and who wanna learn about what we do. Um, so I, that's so Samantha's advice was really great on that point of like, tailor your cover letter to be something other than this template. So I'm going to give another piece of advice that I've now, something I've been talking about a lot and, and really kind of digging in on is that there are a lot of different leadership styles that you read books about. And, you know, lawyers are very different. And I will say that the emotional intelligence of many lawyers running law firms is not very high. Okay. It's just not um, in my experience. Um, but there's a lot being said about leadership training and even like writing, you know, reading books or whatever it may be. Um, but developing you, who you think you want to be as a leader within your firm is a way to distinguish yourself as well as to say, 
you know, I don't want to just be a lawyer. I want to be a leader or, or figuring out if that's true about yourself or what that means. Because I believe that with more leadership training, we can be better lawyers, honestly, um, and better employers and just happier in general. And it's a big focus of what I do, which is focusing on for my team, really focusing on emotional well-being and making sure that like we do check, like I do check-ins with everybody on my team at least once a month, but like really for one specific purpose, they have to meet with me about how they are doing, whether they feel supported, whether they feel like they're getting the growth or the experience, whether like not about cases, but about, do you feel overwhelmed? Is there something we can do or we're not? Because I don't think we pay enough attention to it. And I think we, the associates and the enrollers should demand that we pay attention to it because you're allowed to have a life and you should have a life and you should not be forced to take a caseload that is always too busy, right? It happens, you're always, right? It's always gonna happen, but it shouldn't always be at a million miles an hour, right? And we should demand better of our leadership within our firms. Uh, tailing off of something you mentioned there about, you know, developing that in order to kind of establish who you are as an attorney and to stand out in your firm. What types of things can a, um, you know, a young attorney do in a firm to stand out? Aside from what you just mentioned. Awesome work. <laughs> I think that, I mean, I go back to what I talked about earlier, Chelsea also said something about, which is just, you know, delivering. You know, you say you're going to get it by noon on Tuesday, you deliver it, or if not, you get ahead of it. Being responsive, you know, being open to, um, uh, you know, different ideas, offering your opinion and saying, well, what about this? Not being afraid to say, here's what I'm thinking and here's why. It's a, di you shouldn't look at it as it's, you should look at it as a dialogue. You're having a dialogue with another lawyer in your firm. And that means, opening yourself up and saying, but I'm nervous about this in this case or whatever it may be. And a really good example is that I have a case that's like a bang my head against the wall case right now. And it has been for quite a few years. And I walked out of court recently after a terrible appearance. And like, in all honesty, like I want, I, I was going to cry, but like I wanted to cry. It was just so upsetting that we're still banging our heads against the wall and trying to get to the end of the line. And I had a moment with one of what was an course me who's, you know, been practicing for you know a handful of years. And I was, I, I completely questioned my entire strategy for the last, at least the last six months, but probably in some ways the last years. Like, and I had that moment of vulnerability with somebody who's like, and like she talked me through and we talked about it and I thought about it later on. But it's not, we're all human and we need to remember that. So whether you're an associate or a partner or a senior, whatever it is, it's a dialogue and you have to learn to support each other to have a good practice and to learn from each other because we really all do have valuable experiences to bring and we're not going to always be right. We're not going to always be wrong, but it's, Chelsea said it earlier, like sometimes there is no right or wrong. It's just a choice and remembering that. So stand out by doing a good job and by caring about your job, but also by not letting people not burning yourself out and by being willing to grow and seeing that everything growth is important. I think all of the things that Samantha said are super important. And I think that's feedback that I can give as somebody who delegates some of my work to other associates or summer associates, but not a lot. Um, and just a perspective that I've gained from, you know, we, we do like reviews and stuff. And so we get feedback on our work and on our, how we're performing in, in the organization. And I think that what I want to see and what the partners want to see is an associate who is curious, who is asking good questions, who's thinking about the material, not someone who kind of comes in with a notepad and says, okay, outline the pleading and I'll just go type it. They want to, they want to know that you are thoughtful about your work, that you want to grow and you want to learn and you're interested in, you know, taking a solid position as an associate in this case, instead of just kind of, I'm in a pencil push and that's what I'm here to do is just kind of get the work done. I think it's, it's far 
more impressive, even if you make mistakes or you make the wrong argument or something like that. Like it's, it's not necessarily about getting it wrong. It's that you thought about it. You tried to do a really great job. And if the argument's wrong, you can talk through why it's wrong and you can learn from that. But it's far more impressive than just, oh, okay, the partner said they wanted ABC. I wrote ABC. I'm done now. Like that's, that's less impressive. I want to just say one more thing is that don't just say that there's a problem. Try to come up with a solution too, or one of a solution or several solutions. Um, you're not there to just do what somebody tells you to do. You're there to actually think. And thinking is not just taking in information and, and following instructions. It's really actually thinking and taking a second to step back and think, okay, so what does this mean? Where am I at? What can I do? Whatever else it is. And most people have a place where they do that. Like I typically do that at 5 a.m. when I'm working out, okay? So that's my crazy time. But some people do in the shower, some people do whatever, right? That's important time. And you should give it to yourself because you'll be a better lawyer. And that's also what people want to see, not just partners to associate, but associate to associate. That's really, really important. They want to be able to rely on each other, trust each other's judgment and know, and don't be afraid of being wrong. Just figure it out, just try. My argument in the shower always goes better than the one in the courtroom, but. <laughs> Also, bill for that time. Right. Bill for the thinking time, even if it's in a weird place. Not time. Yeah. All right. So, as we close in on our last couple of minutes, um, our last question for each of you is What is your favorite thing about practicing family law? I can, I can start off with that one. I just, I think it's important to understand that you know, practicing law is difficult and practicing family law is very emotional. And there can be the one thing that I sort of had to prepare myself for is that there's may, may often be more losses than wins. Um, things are not going to go your way. At the end of the day, you're dealing with people's personal lives. And it's it's not something that's textbook. It's, it's something that's very um, you know, near and dear, you, you might be working with people's children or de dealing with issues with people's children or just, you know, other aspects of their very personal lives. And you have to be prepared for those losses. My favorite part is when you actually do kind of get to a win, <laughs> which it, it can, it can be, it can be rare, but, um, for me, it's what makes my job enjoyable is when I know that I've been able to help somebody, um, when I know that I've been able to help somebody get, get protection or some kind of order that helps them make them feel safe. Um, and it's those little things that make the job worth doing for me. Uh, I mean, maybe it sounds cheesy, but like my favorite part of my practice is truly my colleagues, both in the firm and outside of the firm. Like I have met so many amazing lawyers through family law networking events or family law, you know, programs and things like that. Um, and it is, they're some of the most supportive people and they know the unique issues that you experience in your practice, which a lot of times can be very personal. Sometimes lawyers get personal with you. Sometimes, you know, you make mistakes that you really feel like, how could I do that? That was so stupid. Oh my God, I'm an idiot. Like, and th there's always someone out there who's like, I did it. I did that thing. It's really okay. Like, uh, we're, we're all in the same boat. We all make mistakes. It's fine. Like, uh, and even when you have sort of a difficult opposing counsel, or maybe the it's not the your opposing counsel, it's just their client is a really difficult client, and they're trying to represent them to the best of their ability. But you learn so much from those challenges too when you're working with difficult people, and um, it's just been really, really amazing to like work with this community of lawyers. And I'm I I don't know if there's any other practice area out there like it, but I'd venture to say like there isn't. I think this is a pretty unique group of folks. Just, I like, I like solving problems. I like trying to make it better. And I like to try to stay out of court because I think court is bad for, except for there are limited circumstances. My piece is one of them where you have to go to court, but there are a lot of circumstances where you don't. And in those circumstances, you should do everything you can to avoid it because it's better. It's healthier for people and it's better for their families. And so I like solving problems and staying out of court to the greatest degree possible whenever I can. I actually want to push back on that. I try to avoid going to court as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I don't mean you try to go to court, but sometimes there are things you have yeah. to go to court about. There's yeah. just it is what it is. It's that's what you have to do. I think I just I think that's such an important perspective. Like ooh, again, I, I keep saying the same thing over and over. We're all just dealing with people. We're all humans, and we all have our own unique things. And there's so many ways that you can solve a family's problem that are not just court remedy this or that like there's so many things in between this or that that could work for somebody's particular situation and if the parties can make an agreement there that they all feel comfortable it's just so much better for their family instead of looking at a judge and being like tell me whether it's black or white that's it like that th th doesn't work for everyone and that's not that's not always the best solution Well, thank you all. Um, thank you to our wonderful attendees and also our amazing panelists. We're so grateful um, for your time and your insight. Um, thank you all so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>